Hello, everybody. Greetings. I was just saying that I've, we've, we've been, my Polish partner and myself have been um, demonstrating outside the Polish embassy. We just came straight from there. We actually, we got into the embassy, I'm glad to say, and we were telling them that we don't think the government's treating the small farmers well in Poland. I work out there quite a lot of the time. Um, I'm the president's president of something called the International Coalition to Protect the Polish Countryside. And one of our jobs is to try and stop genetically modified organisms getting into Poland and to try and preserve the future of these small farms, of which are still 1.5 million, mostly self-sufficient small holdings. And they're being forced out of the way by the European Union and the corporations and governments who are like this together, you know. They work as one club, these monsters. And so people have to stand up for these small farmers because they haven't got much of a voice. So one of my jobs is to do that. I, I'm a person that does a lot of different things. That's why giving any type of talk is extremely difficult for me. I never really know where to begin or where to end. But however, now if I know I've got a quarter of an hour, I'll try and be disciplined enough to talk mostly about my book, In Defense of Life, Essays on a Radical Reworking of Green Wisdom. I thought I might just read the first paragraph of my introduction that tells quite succinctly something about me. It says, I experience life as an essentially joyous gift which is severely jolted each time some sanitizing force tries to block its celebratory instinct. That's its instinct of celebration. I recognize that normal is the word used to describe this sanitized condition and that most of society suffers in consequence from normality. But I believe that this state is not inevitable and is the result of a largely superficial and superimposed process of indoctrination that blocks us from discovering something far more potent and joyous in ourselves and in the life we aspire to build around us. If that whets your appetite for the book, I, I'm glad, because it's very diverse what I speak about. And that's partly because I'm trained as an actor, I'm an organic farmer, one of the first in England. There were only six of us when I started converting my farm in 1975 in this country. Um, I'm an activist, I'm a social entrepreneur. I don't know what else I am. I've run cafes, I've, I've done all sorts of interesting things. I'm a cook. So, what all these have in common is an, is an element of creativity. And the creativity is something we're all born with. It's our greatest gift. In fact, if you think of a child, a child is pure creativity, pure spirit, pure godliness. So why is it that children so quickly are taught to move in another direction? from being what they are. And that this is a subject which we might try and deal with in the quarter of an hour and talking about the book, because essentially it is really our educational system that's most to blame for driving us in a direction which is totally contrary to our deeper interests. And since this is taking place in a spiritual bookshop, obviously the issue is our deeper interests and how those deeper interests can be expressed and how they can be manifest within society as a whole. Because at the moment, we're marginalized. You know, people that care about life. That's why the book's called In Defense of Life. Because life itself is under threat. The whole of life, not just one aspect or another. It's not just about the economy or the environment or health or uh, economics or the land, any of these things. It's about all of them. And if you do your research and look at the roots of the issues that have gone wrong, you find that they connect up. And they connect up because somewhere in his history or prehistory, we went off course, badly off course, because it seems like gatherers at the time of hunter-gatherers, and now going back a long time, um, really had a very remarkable uh, affinity with nature. You see, affinity with nature. This is the key. Uh, that affinity of nature meant that they could see the rings around Jupiter without even a pair of binoculars. 
They could hear the tiniest rustling sound of animals in bushes. They could sense the way the weather was going to change. They didn't need supercomputers, you know, vast binoculars, huge corporations devoted only to trying to achieve one type of power. They lived on the land, you know. They wouldn't have needed nuclear power. They wouldn't have conceived of such a thing. What's, what's the point? The first and most important form of energy is us. You know? This is where the energy issue begins. The energy begins here. Well, you can argue till you're green or blue in the face about whether it should be windmills or solar energy or water energy or nuclear or oil or gas and which of them is causing global uh, climate change. But actually, do we need all that energy from the outside? I don't think so. I think if we expressed our own energy in its fullness, in its creativity that I was describing as a child has, we would find that we didn't want half that energy. Literally didn't want it. Because we would find our own energy gave us so much more. And we would then realize that this is an unaccountable luxury, all these other things. And unfortunately, they are highly destructive environmentally. Not only environmentally, Interesting word, environmental, right? Environmental, so what about purely mental? You know, I see people on mobile phones, on trains, talking away non-stop for hours, and I can't understand it, and I'm thinking, all this electromagnetic stuff going through the brain can't be good for us, you know? What are they talking about, eh? Hello, oh, I'm just crossing the road now, I was just crossed the road, and I saw a lovely pair of shoes, and. Nike shoes and such and such thing and a pair of jeans and I thought, should I buy them or shouldn't I buy them? I thought, no, I won't really buy those today because the price might go down tomorrow. So then I was walking back across the road and a dog walked across and I felt so sorry for it because it looks such a nice little dog. See? And is that the best we human beings can do in our very brief lives here on planet Earth? I mean, is that why we're generating all this energy? Just so we can have meaningless conversations? No. Clearly, it's not. And I make that point only to illustrate how off the road we appear to have gone. So what would it be? The first thing to try and do is to get earthed. Now, I'm a farmer, and I was very fortunate to grow up in a very beautiful part of England, where the land is good enough to grow crops and trees, and it has a beautiful landscapes. And I was, as a young boy, appreciating this beauty very much. But I rapidly understood that things weren't really what they looked like on the surface. Underneath, things were going wrong because mankind had adopted a view about food production, which is about very large scale, supplying supermarkets, for instance. And the food that supplied the supermarket was being produced using a lot of chemicals. And they're all toxic. And it started with something called nitrate, which used to be part of the munitions industry in the Second World War. And there was a lot of this nitrate left over. So then some bright spark discovered that if you threw it on the ground, it makes the grass grow rather quicker than uh, if you leave the grass to grow. <laughs> so, <laughs> the problem was it, with it was that they started using it on crops, let's say on wheat, you know. And the thing was that they discovered after a bit that the wheat grew faster as well. But the stem of the wheat slightly changed. The DNA of the wheat became weaker. And what happened then? The pests attacked it. Now previously the pests hadn't attacked it. Only when they started using this synthetic fertilizer. It's not really fertilizer. This fertilizer feeds the soil. This doesn't feed the soil. It feeds the root plant. Root. It's like when you drink a Coca-Cola, you suddenly get a energy thing, and then you ugh about three or four hours later. Exactly what happens in farm with these plants. So then the farmer said, oh God, what are we going to do? The plants are being attacked by pests. Well, the agrochemical industry had an answer for that. We've got to pull a pesticide. Oh yes, you spray that on the field three or four times a year and it'll get rid of the pests. Uh, oh, all right, all right, said the farmer. We'll try it. Yes, okay, it worked for a little bit, but not for very long. And then other problems, like fungus attacks, terrible, terrible fungus attacks, never seen before. 
What are we going to do? Oh, we've got the answer to that. Fungicide. Yes, it's a synthetic product. Yes, it's a bit toxic. But it'll solve the problem. You won't have any more fungi. Spray that on at least five times during the season two. And so they've got your nitrate, you can spray it on. You've got your pesticides, you've got your fungicide, you've got your herbicides. So it goes on and on and on. And by the end of the day, the, what you're eating is not food. Really. I mean it. You can take it from me, and I've had 30 years' experience in farming. I started off with a farm which was going down the route of this agrochemical approach, and I managed to stop it and go down a route towards something called organic farming. And we are only six of us in the country at that time. That was 1975. And I had just come back from being working in experimental theatre with an American company called the Players Theatre of New England. And we'd been working on the connection between voice, music, movement, and text. I hope you can follow this. You have to be very, very lateral thinking to follow me. Um, and I was 10 years working with these people. And we started school. We started to teach children the connection between drama and academics. So instead of sitting all day having their heads crammed with useless information, we suddenly got them up on their feet and they started acting out plays. And then we gave them also the basics that they needed in academic studies. And they had wonderful flowering of creativity in these children. <coughs> but it got to the point where I had to come back home to England and take on this family farm, which I inherited. And the Sir is also inherited. For anyone that thinks I was given a title by this Her Majesty the Queen, I'm sorry to say the answer is no. Well, maybe I'm glad to say as much. Right it was inherited. Uh, so I inherited the title and I inherited the farm uh, when my brother was killed in a motor racing accident and my father died three years later of a stroke, and I was the youngest in the family wanting to go into the acting profession. Suddenly, I had a 900-acre farm on my shoulders, and I had to figure out what to do with it. So anyway, after this experience in experimental theatre, I had to, at a certain point, go back to England, and I had to think, what am I going to do with this farm? I knew nothing about farming. And very fortunately, I met an organisation called the Soil Association, and they said there's something called organic farming. We're just developing it. And the organic farming has a very interesting thing about it. It's about health. Not just health of people, health of soil, health of people, health of the atmosphere, health of the trees, plants. And he said that health is a wheel. Think of it as a, a dynamic wheel. And that wheel is composed of soil, plant, animal, and man. And if you upset any one of those chain of four, you will upset the other three. So if you upset any one of those links, the other three will be affected. Now that is called holistic thinking. In a very practical way, that is what holistic thinking actually is. So I was thinking to myself, wow, this is the same as what I was doing in the theatre. We were talking about the connection between voice, movement, text and music. You know, at one underneath, one thing. But when you spread them out, you see them as separate things. And I thought, soil, plant, animal and man. Yes, one holistic concept. And immediately I sort of said to myself, this is something I want to do. I must do it. You know, I was passionate about it. And I jumped in the deep end and I started experiencing what it was like to farm. I started very small with just two cows selling unpasteurized milk in the local area. And then I got some free range hens and I got a few pigs and I got some sheep and it, got on, on, and it built up and it built up and it built up and I sold everything locally, fresh, local, seasonal. Because I never liked the sort of food you get in big supermarket chairs. And I never didn't analyse why I didn't like it. But I didn't like it ultimately because I realised it wasn't real food. And I realised that what I was producing and what I'd eaten as a boy growing up on my farm was real food. And it was fortunate that I had that experience because I could tell the difference. It wasn't difficult to tell the difference. The real food is living, you know. If you've ever had the opportunity to go into a garden and pick something straight off a tree or some fruit straight off a fruit tree or a bush, if you like, or even a plant straight out of the ground and put it in your mouth, you'll experience a rush of energy. And if you try doing that with something you buy in Tesco, you're filling your stomach a little bit, might even taste reasonable, but the difference is enormous. The reason is because Tesco is a huge supermarket chain which 
buys its food on the global marketplace. And you don't know where your food's coming from when you buy from there. It's the same at Sainsbury's, it's the same at all these, these things. You have no idea. They might even say occasionally. And it's coming over a five-day period before it reaches the shelves. And it's been through five different temperature changes. It's travelled on average, we did research, over 6,000 kilometres now. At the time they said 3,500. It's now gone up to 6,000 kilometres. Is the average distance travelled by a shopping basket of supermarket food. Now, and it's wrapped in plastic. It can't breathe. It's put under neon lights on plastic shelves. If it had life in it, that's finished. Think of yourself. Think of yourself being put through those conditions. You start off vigorous human being. What would you feel like after you've been five days on the road and shoved through different temperature changes and landed up on a plastic shelf? You know, you'd be depleted. And that's exactly what food is. So one of my first initiations into experiencing this more holistic approach to life was being forced to be a farmer. And these days, many, many people live in cities. And farmers are quite scarce on the ground, real farmers. So how could city people have this type of experience? Because you ought to. Everybody should have this sort of experience, not just people with land. How could they do it? Fortunately, in the last few years, <coughs> cities like London, New York, Paris, all over the world, many people are having the same thought. We want to help them grow. We want to put some water on them. We want to be, in some way or other, starting to take our destinies back instead of being reliant upon vast, soulless, depleted, sterile corporations. Corporations now own 60 to 70 percent of all the seeds in commercial agriculture and in fact just three corporations own over 50 percent. Just three corporations own over 50 percent of the seeds and they're patenting them and they're genetically modifying them and they're owning them and they will say whether you can have them or whether you can't. So we are at a crisis point and it's useful to see it through the eyes of food, because food is something we need every day of our lives. If we only allow ourselves the luxury, the naive luxury, of thinking that someone else will always look after us, we're in for serious trouble. But if we start taking control of our destinies, and if we start deciding how we want our lives to run, and we start making it happen, we are in for some very, very exciting times. And of course we should work together. No one can do everything on their own, so we should work together. So if I was in a city, the first thing I would do would be have a little window box, maybe on the inside of the window to start with, and I, or even just a cardboard box full of earth. And I would plant something in it, ideally a salad crop, because a salad crop grows quite fast, and you'll be able to pick it and eat it. You know, and you'll be able to invite friends. And then, in, if you have success with that, you can develop these hanging baskets. You've seen them on ropes. They're sort of baskets on ropes. You find them in shop. And then you can have, you know, salad there. And you can have, oh, or you can grow something like um, some scented flowers in another one. And you can grow herbs in another one. So you start having a miniature garden in your own flat. <clears throat> and they will grow, believe me. A little bit of sunshine. You do the watering. You watch them grow under your own eyes. And if that excites you, you can then start getting involved with people who are doing it outside. And there are people called guerrilla gardeners, quite a few in London now, supporting real farmers. You will not be supporting great, big, anonymous corporations that are destroying our planet. So we, every day of our lives, are responsible for the future. See, where we put our money is the first step. If we go to a supermarket, we're supporting globalised agriculture and the destruction of the planet. If we go to a small shop, farmer's market, farmers themselves directly, or we start growing our own, we're doing the opposite. We're supporting planet Earth. We're supporting the future of our children and our grandchildren. We're connecting up with people who live in poorer parts of the world, because that's how they live. What right have we got? Us northern western Europeans to destroy the planet 
when the millions and billions and billions of other people are struggling to make a living. We need to be a bit more humble. We need to experience what it means to be someone who's struggling to make their own living on the land. But if we do it together in a spirit of joy, in a spirit of creativity, we can, it can be a pleasure and not a pain. So I've probably spoken for about a quarter of an hour. I have no idea because I'm not looking at, nobody's looking at their watches and the camera is probably still rolling, although it's beeping rather ominously occasionally. And uh, I would love to just have a chat with you about this subject because you can see it excites me very much. And in the book, incidentally, um, I do deal with the issue of farming fairly centrally and also my experiences with Jadwiga in Poland and the actions we've taken in supporting the peasants. Jadwiga and I and one or two colleagues managed to uh, help the uh, citizens of Poland keep genetically modified organisms out of their country by getting every province in Poland to declare itself a GMO-free zone. And then we, we told the people who won the provincial board of those provinces to write to the president of Poland and tell the president, you should ban genetically modified organisms because we don't like them, we don't want them. And the, he did. And that was in 2006. And that whole campaign was done by about five people over a period of one and a half years. So don't end anyone and tell me you can't do it. We did it. Uh, I'm not saying that to pat, up, to pat my back. I'm saying it to prove the incredible power of creativity if we can channel it and use it. We can change the world tomorrow. Today. Now. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Food. What price cheap food? I know what cheap food is. Cheap food is, is, is what's trashing the planet. But worst of all is, is when it comes to the animal kingdom. Cheap food is uh, 8,000 chickens who never see the light of day, whose food is genetically modified and full of antibiotics because it couldn't survive without the antibiotics. They would die under those circumstances. They live for three months when they could live for six years. They're dispatched on a huge chain automatically, millions of them, and that is what you go and buy when you buy cheap food. So if you go and do that sort of thing, what are you supporting? You're supporting the worst aspects of factory farming. No fresh, hardly any fresh air. Uh, the light is neon, and it's kept on ooh, 16 hours a day. A virtually force-fed, shocking diet. Uh, again, genetically modified, mostly maize and soy, imported from North America. Again, antibiotics from the food. Um, various other forms of medicaments to try and keep them on their feet. They are fattened within four months. I fattened my pigs <coughs> over approximately nine months. And then they're killed. And then people say, oh, I just found a wonderful bargain. <coughs> Sainsbury's, you know. It's just a, a nice bit of pork. And it's a special offer, whatever it was. And they think that they're getting a bargain. <coughs> well, they're not only killing themselves, they're killing the planet. And this is the same across the food chain. Now, it's, it's not nice to be told this, especially if you haven't thought about it and you're on that type of regime because you don't understand what's going on. But I'm uniquely placed in a way because I've had the experience from both sides as a buyer and as a farmer. So I can tell you quite honestly, and I have nothing to lose from telling it because I, you know, it's, it's not, I'm not representing some corporation. I'm just telling you the truth. And if you really want to be healthy, you've got to be healthy in mind, body and spirit. So what do you have where would we go to for shopping? If you want to go shopping for, it depends what you're going to go shopping for, but if you're going to go shopping for good quality foods, there are a number of different places available for you to do it. And uh, some of them are, are rather large and some of them are very small. Uh, but I wouldn't actually recommend any of them. I'd recommend farmers markets. Uh, the farmers markets are now about seven or eight in London. They will happen at different times, so you'd have to coordinate it by looking at the internet. And you'll find where they are. There's hopefully one taking place near you. The nearest one here would probably be Spitalfields. Uh, but there you will actually get real farm food brought in by real farmers, and you can talk to them about how they grew it. Most of them are moving towards organic or are organic because they're enthusiasts, you know. They love the food they sell you, and, you know, they're, they're, they're great people. And so you have a sort of direct contact with the countryside that way. Other shops, well, if you want the sort of big end, you can go to Whole Foods. Whole Foods in Kensington High Street. 
Barkers. Used to be Barkers. Oh, really? Are they organic? Well, you look. Use your eyes. You can read, can't you? Read label. Now, if it says organic and it's got a symbol on it of some sort, it's organic. Yeah, but why you recommend Whole Food uh, apart from Tesco or other things? Tesco? No, the, the difference there is... Sure, I understand what you're saying. The difference to that is that Tesco is by and large using organic as a little green icing on a very young green cake. You know, it's a sales job. They're not interested remotely in people's health. <laughs> I mean, 98% of their food is, is rubbish. And what's more, it's produced under conditions of virtual slavery in different parts of the world where people are being paid very, very low wages. Whole Foods is dedicated to another approach. It's dedicated to an approach that supports the longevity of the planet, supports soil fertility, supports health by offering qu good quality foods, and, and a lot of organic, yes. I don't know what the percentage uh, what is. What do you think Could about uh, community shops like uh, Indian, Arabs? Uh, yes, like those I would recommend too. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of London, of course, it's so eclectic that you'll actually probably find much better food in those, in those shops than you will, you know, chasing the big boys down. Yes, certainly. I mean, then, of course, you have to get to know the, the shopkeepers. You have to try and establish what's authentic and what's not. Uh, and if you get a good feeling from people and you, you like the taste of the food, and you, you should go to those, because that way you're also supporting people who need your help. You know, Tesco makes £3.5 billion pounds profit every year. And all it does is establishes more and more of its stores, which force tiny little nice independent shops out of business all over England and all over the world. So, you know, that is for people not to support. It's the first thing to understand. Never support the big corporation. Uh, use your intuition. You know, this is a great place we're in today. It's all about a place where you actually trust your intuition. And trusting one's intuition is the starting point in getting on the spiritual path. So unless you can trust your, spirit, your intuition, it's going to be, life's going to be very difficult. So I would say the actual answer is look for the smaller end. I mean, I don't recommend Whole Foods, frankly, but I did try to give an example of where you can buy. You know, I wasn't really answering it on the subtler level. And I agree with you. I think you have to be cynical. When there's a very, very big organization as well, vast. You know, it's lost control of itself, in my view. So you'd be better off... Um, looking at the smaller scale people, the small families who are trying to make a living doing it that way, and as I say, the farmers' markets. And if you can get out into the countryside at all, then you know, try a few things like that. Uh, all the information you will be able to find, if you really want to, on the great thing called the internet. Yeah. Uh, on my farm, we sell organic vegetables on what's called a box scheme. And this is another very nice thing. A box scheme is where the farmer boxes up, and it's not using any packaging really other than a cardboard box and a, a small paper bag. The products which are grown at the right season, um, fresh and local, and they're sold within a certain radius of the farm, usually around about 20 miles. There are some people who supply organic or organic boxes to London from Devon. Now, to my mind, that rather destroys the whole concept because it's a long way. And if you really want to support local, you should buy close to where you live rather than buying from the far end of the country. But nevertheless, it's a starting point, and the food will be quite remarkably delicious. You never know what you're getting. You're getting what the farmer plants. You know, it's, it's a surprise every week. So you open your thing, what's in there today? You know, celeriac. Ooh, what's celeriac? How do I cook that, you know? Uh, red beets, it's got uh, leeks, onions, yes, yeah, you know. And, and then it'll change because basically in the farming calendar, you, you, you can't grow all the same things all the year round. So you get the foods which represent the different seasons. And that's bringing you back closer to the earth and re-educating us about what is fresh, what is local, what is seasonal. Some people want strawberries at Christmas time. God knows why. Some people want tomatoes, you know, and suddenly at uh, Easter. Well, tomatoes aren't ripe until July, unless you get them from California. But, you know, this idea that we've got all this choice, very, very clever propaganda. Very clever propaganda. You know, it's, it's a vast machine. We need to see through it.
and start taking... Where is your farm? Robert? Where is my farm? It's in South Oxfordshire. It's just the other mm. side of Reading, if you know where Reading is. Reading? Reading's about um, half hour on the train going west of London. Because in your article you said that you are living in Somerset, No, no, not me. There must be someone else. Somebody writing to me in a free range isn't worth because they can actually only walk around in about three square yeah. even if they're free range. Yeah. That's it. Free range is actually a good step. Um, very important, I would say. I mean, the difference between a caged chicken, battery farm house fed chicken, you know, which I described, 12,000 in this huge darkened shed, and a free range chicken is huge. The difference is huge. One gets a life and the other doesn't. Oh, right. I thought they could only walk around in no, 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 that's not free range, <laughs> no. Free range is allowed to range on a big area. Yeah. And they have to have access to outdoor free range. They have to be able to go onto the... Yeah. They have to go onto the grass, you see, and walk around on the grass. So their shed has to have a, a, a door which you open and they can walk out if they want to. But these other sheds which are factory farming, they have no such thing, you know. They don't have any option. They have no room to move. They have... Very, very short space, just very, very sh small space to move in. A very good organisation called Compassion in World Farming, for anyone who is interested in trying to understand the way animals are treated in our farming. Compassion in World Farming, I do recommend it to you. They do wonderful campaigns for trying to get the government to change the regulations to make animals, have a, give animals a decent life. But if you really want a guarantee of good animal welfare standards, you should buy Soil Association certified food. But I was involved with my colleagues in writing the standards for that back in the 1980s, and we were very, very strong on animal welfare. We made a big, big point of it, and we were thought to be completely over the top at the time. People said, oh, you're crazy, you could never run a farm like that. You know? You'd be bankrupt overnight. You know? But we proved that you can, and that people actually will buy this food, even if they have to pay a little bit more for it, because they'll be realising that they're supporting our animal cousins, rather than destroying them. We are animals. I must say, it is often a lot more money. That some are, food. some are. What I've done is cut down, I don't eat very much meat like you. No. So what I do, which is probably only poultry, yes, turkey, yes. I uh, buy organic. Right. Now, yeah. the way I've economically done it is I don't eat it very much. No. Well, that's fair enough. I mean, really. The funny thing is about the spiritual part. That, I mean, it seems that the, the more you grow into it, the less food you need. I don't know whether you've had that experience. I certainly do. And um, certain foods really go against it. And again, it's about one's intuition and one's sensitivity. One listens, you know, to oneself. Certain foods just don't agree with it, and you feel rather, you know, ooh, heavy, and you can't seem to get the light. So. But other foods seem to accentuate it and, and help, and that is very important. And everybody's different in this. There are some generalizations which are true, but after that, everybody is different, and everybody has to find the balance for themselves. But I think you'd have made a very wise choice: buy less, but buy organic. Fish is a difficult one. There is organic fish, but it's 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 curious, really. Well, you see, there, a lot of fish is now farmed in lakes, specially designed lakes. It's not necessarily sea fish. Mm -hmm. So normally, those sort of fish are fed again f at a feed which is laced with antibiotics, and the fish have very poor conditions. The water isn't running properly, etc., etc., etc. But in organic, it has to be done just as though it was the water was the soil. You see. The same principle. So you're feeding it with all the right things. And then you get organic fish coming out at the other end. And yes, I, I also... That is a lot more expensive. Yeah, they are actually. That's true. They are a lot more expensive. Yes. Well, you, you know, there are some sea fish that are still quite, quite reasonable, but in there, which simply negates purity of food. So I would actually rather prefer to suggest that if you're really a keen fish eater, you do choose organic fish production from you know, inland waterways which are kept very carefully. But there's no such thing as total purity in the world today. There isn't. Forget it. 
everything it's compromise. But you want to go for the top end of the compromise, the one where people are trying their hardest to give you something which is real. Yeah. You you get the point is you can refine your taste buds sure. and your reaction to things by really concentrating when you're doing you know when when you see people with fine glass of, of, of Bordeaux or something, you know? And you get the wine taste and he you know, he decants it very, very carefully, and another dregs come in the bottom, and then he does this and then he goes smells it, oh yeah, you know, and then he does a little bit more jiggling and then he takes a tiny bit and puts it on the tongue. Like that. Well, you can do that with food. I mean, it's a great experience, it's fun. You just take a tiny little mouth and start playing with it, you know, and start working on it and you see what it gives you, what it's offering, what it's saying to you, what it's, it's, it's talking to you, it's, it's energy. We're energy, it's energy. We're just energy on different planes. And if you can find a subtle plane within the food chain, it'll complement the subtle chain in your spiritual development. And if you support that, they'll both grow, you see. And I, that's why I'm an activist, is the last thing I'll probably say on that, and why we were at the Polish Embassy, because I say, it's in this magazine, I've written an article called The World is Our Garden. You'll find it there. And basically what I say is, the world is our garden, if you don't look after it, it'll die. If you don't fight for it, it'll die. So that's why you've got to be activists today. There's no way right around it. If you want to be spiritual, you've got to be an activist. Because if you love your garden, but you don't care what people do outside it, what kind of spiritual being are you? You know, the Lord said, the world is your garden. We are responsible for this planet. There's no way of getting out of it. Every one of us, every decision we make every day of our lives is either for or against the future of this planet. Very, very issue, serious issue, very exciting issue, because it means that we've got a major, major job to do. And there can be no doubt that we've got to do it and that we will win. But we do need to speed up the process of getting onto this and getting going with it. So that, that issue, I think, is, the activism one is we must fight for those things which we value and not expect them to survive because, quite frankly, the corporate and the governments and the European Union and all these people aren't interested in it. They're only interested in power. It's not even money they're interested in. They've got plenty of that. They're interested in power and control. And when you get to the levels of the Monsanto and Cargills of this world, they literally want to control the whole food chain. And they're well down the road to doing it. That means we're slaves. You see? Slaves to corporations. If we want to overcome being slaves to corporations, we have to take control of our own destinies. And this is why I'm, I'm very overjoyed to be allowed to give this talk here today. And meet people who are clearly, you know, interested in, in trying to save the planet and trying to further their own creativity and their own spirituality. It, all one thing. There's no separation between any of those things, in my view. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think why you go to buy seeds in London. Uh, hmm. Good question. I mean, <laughs> I'm not a Londoner, you see, the trouble is I, I'm not sure I can send you in a, to a specific place, but um, if you got in touch with one of these uh, cooperatives that do exist in London now, which produce, do box schemes, for instance, we were just talking to someone today from North Lear, L-E-A, farm, it's in North London, they supply a lot of organic food into London, it's actually in London. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, right. Good. Well, I would, uh, I would uh, put the question to them. Actually, I mean it. Yes, that would seem a very sensible thing to do. But it's a very good question you're, answering, you're asking because seeds, you see, are also um, a highly political issue. <coughs> the seeds are grown in, in, in the large corporations and by the large corporations, controlled by the large corporations, are hybrid and super hybrid seeds. That means they've been developed and developed and developed sheerly for volume. But the older seeds, which are called, in Britain, they're called heirloom seeds. And there's quite a lot of organizations in England doing them. So if you look up, what? Maybe you look up the word heritage. Heritage seeds on the internet. You'll be able to find places to buy these heritage seeds. And they are the real, old, good quality, strong, resistant seeds. 
and they have much more energy in them themselves than the modern hybrid seeds sown by the big companies. And if you grow it from year to year, for example, if I plant tomatoes or cucumbers, yeah. whatever, um, it will be Yes. Right, okay. Well, you can probably do it for two or three years, certainly, but then you'd have to swap with someone else because what happens is the seeds become more susceptible to certain diseases and the soil, as you like, you know, develops usually certain pathogenic materials which those seeds lose the ability, gradually lose the ability to defend themselves against. So then you swap those seeds with someone else who's growing them in another area and they come with renewed vigour, and that is why farmers swap seeds. Otherwise, all farmers would only save their own seeds. It's been proven over eons of time that swapping seeds with other farmers in different locations prefers the vigour in the seeds and the ability for it to resist disease. So you'd have to join a little club of people. Better still start one yourself. I've got great faith in you. I have a strong feeling you're going to be a, a leader in this field. Uh, you start a little club, like someone I asked to do it in, in my witch church in my village. She started, and lots of people came, and she was amazed. People, you know, who had seeds growing in their gardens, who didn't know what to do with them. They, you know, just let them go. And think about it. And then you started a seed club, and everyone started picking them finally and swapping them, and thinking, wow, yours is good, that one's good, that one didn't grow so well, that one did. And it, it's very sociable, as well as being good, you know, valuable. So... I would recommend that. And as I said, the seeds themselves, look for heritage seeds on the internet. You'll find quite a lot of very, very good little organizations in England producing high quality, older variety seeds, which are not hybridized. Watch out for hybridization, you know. They talk, well, they say that, well, they say this is a hybridized seed. Yeah, you'll, it, it'll say on the, on the packet, and you can find out from the people saying them to you about that. Yeah, sure. It will say. It'll say on the package, yes. It'll tell you most of the information you need on the package. It'll also tell you when to sow them, you know, what time of the year to sow them, how deep soil. You know, it's usually, it's usually about a centimetre under the soil for almost all seeds, but a few of them have very slightly different ways. Yeah, go for it. Go for it.